station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I'm ready. We're ready. KCRG TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Jay Green with KCRG TV. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear, Jay. It's great to be speaking with you. What's life like in outer space for you so far? Uh, it's been great. Uh, we've been here. It's hard to believe it. We've been here over a month. Uh, and, yeah, time is flying by. But, uh, yeah, it's been amazing getting to work and do science and float. And, yeah, it's a pretty incredible job. What's been your uh, biggest adjustment other than no gravity? <laughs> I think that, uh, that's the biggest one. I think the biggest thing is uh, realizing the workspace is, is three-dimensional, and you can walk on the walls, the ceilings. Uh, as you can kind of see, there's wires all over the place, so being conscious of where your feet are at, but also being able to rotate and do work uh, you know, on a rack that's on the wall normally and that being completely natural. Uh, so, yeah, getting used to that and, and constantly reorienting your body to whatever the task is takes some getting used to. You were actually selected to be part of this a few years ago. Do you remember the exact time you got the phone call that said you're doing this and what was going through your mind at the time? Yeah, I actually remember it really well. I was uh, actually at Edwards Air Force Base. I was getting ready to go fly. So I was about to go brief for a flight and I had told uh, the folks I was working with, I might get a phone call because we knew the calls were going out that day. So literally as I was walking out to go brief the flight, the phone rang and uh, some of the other people in the flight were standing around and, and one of the things they told us is we couldn't tell anyone so I had to stand on the phone and they were all watching. They knew we were getting calls and I had to pretend like it was no big deal, like it was just another phone call. So I was just like, uh-huh, yep, yep, and put the phone down and tried to act like nothing was going on. After the brief, uh, called my wife and told her uh, and then it wasn't for several weeks that actually everyone figured out that that was actually the phone call uh, telling me I had gotten picked. What do you hope to accomplish up there in your six months? Well, so, Jay, we have about 300 uh, pieces of science we're doing to include this thing that just floated off the wall at me, uh, one of the uh, Astro Bees that tests out some um, basically drone technology and um, autonomous in uh, intelligence. But, uh, yeah, coming up on SpaceX and a Cargo Dragon in a few weeks, there's some uh, experiments we'll be doing uh, for cancer protein research to basically work on uh, different ways to deliver cancer drugs as well as some... Uh, things, uh, some basically 3D printed bandages to help wounds grow, uh, repair faster. So uh, every day it's kind of a different set of experiments. It's, uh, it's kind of the beauty of this job is you never know what you're going to be working at next day. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, every day is a, a new set of uh, hopefully life-changing science for people on Earth. You uh, went to high school in Waterloo, right? Uh, did you know you wanted to go into space at that, at, at, when you were in high school? So I think uh, as a young kid and uh, like a five-year-old, I definitely wanted to go to space. I think in junior high and high school, I, uh, I think in the idea of trying to set realistic goals, thinking astronaut was never a thing I could do, I, I had really fixed that on going to the Air Force Academy, and that was really my goal. And it wasn't until I got a little older that I actually revisited that original dream and realized I could actually become an astronaut, that that was actually a, a possibility. Um, but it was definitely something I was... The idea of flying and exploring uh, and kind of pushing human knowledge was something I was definitely interested in in high school. What was the reaction from your family when you said, hey, dad's going to outer space? I think it varied. Uh, my kids are uh, varying ages. I think the youngest one was like, whatever, uh, it didn't really register until I, I think we went to Florida to go on the rocket. Uh, the other ones are pretty excited and, uh, you know, they still... Uh, I get to talk to them uh, on the phone and video calls from time to time, and they're pretty excited, and it's pretty cool to, to see them and talk to them and, and hear about what's going on back home. Uh, and obviously I miss them, but uh, it's a pretty we stay really well connected, and they're definitely excited and uh, happy to be part of the journey. Any chance that you'll uh, walk on Mars? That'd be great. Uh, hopefully humans get there. That's our plan. Um, a lot of what we're doing here on the station is to test out technology for the moon and Mars. So we have the benefit here of being uh, close to home and with backup systems. So that if something breaks, we have something else to use. 
Um, but a lot of what we're doing is testing the uh, life support systems that we would use to sustain human presence on Moon and then eventually on Mars. But uh, yeah, the, the Artemis uh, program, that's what we're doing right now, is, is working on that technology. And uh, my class, as well as everyone in the astronaut office, is helping with that development. What do you think will be your biggest challenge up there? Uh, in, in the near term, I think just uh, uh, staying ahead of things. So every day is, is different. And so a lot of what we're doing uh, is the, the result of years of research and work by scientists on the ground. So trying to make sure that we do, the, do, the, do our due diligence to, to succeed and make sure that their experiments uh, work well. So a lot of work on our part to make sure that works. So that's the near term. I think in the long term for the Artemis program, uh, you know, it's, it's the human lander system. We have the gateway, which is the, the station around the moon. We have the SLS rocket. We have the Orion module and the HLS, uh, the lander that gets us from the gateway down to the surface is the thing we're working on now. So that's a, a lot of uh, engineers and uh, astronauts working on developing that program as we speak, and it's coming along quickly. But I think that'll be the, the biggest uh, challenge here as we move forward and, and send humans back to the moon to stay. One final question for you. What, uh, what do you want to say to the people of Eastern Iowa? I uh, will say uh, I got to see the from see Iowa from space the other day. I was able to trace back the Mississippi and then look west and see the snow line. So I could tell there's some folks in Iowa that have snow and others that are lucky enough to not have it and definitely snow up here. But uh, definitely thank the folks of Iowa for the upbringing I got. Uh, it definitely, you know, those Midwest ethics and work values are why I'm here. And, uh, you know, that that culture of a, a small town kind of, you know, community, but uh, also lots of opportunities. So to the people of Cedar Falls, Waterloo, and all of Northeast Iowa, thanks uh, for getting me here. And uh, I love looking down there and, and seeing that snow line halfway through the state. All right, Station, that uh, finishes my portion of the interview. All right, thanks, Jay. Have a good day. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KCRG TV portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from the Kitsap Sun. Station, this is Josh Farley from the Kitsap Sun of the USA Today Network. How do you read me? I have you loud and clear, Josh. How do you read me? Uh, very well, thanks. Good, good morning, Kayla. How are you doing this morning? I am fantastic. How are things on the Kitsap Peninsula? Oh, they're great. They're great. Thanks so much for taking some time to talk with me this morning. Um, you, you've talked a lot about the parallels between uh, submarines, of course, and now being in space. And I just wondered now that you've launched if you feel the same way, if, uh, how, how, um, how is, uh, is that reality? I feel that more and more every day that I spend aboard the International Space Station. The parallels between the submarine force and working up here in space are really endless for me. It's a similar challenge if you think about it, where you're taking a group of human beings who are trying to accomplish a pretty big set of goals, a pretty big mission, and you're sending them into an environment where human beings aren't normally meant to be, whether that be deep under the surface of the ocean or in the vacuum of space. So all of the engineering challenges we need to solve to keep human beings alive and allow us to thrive and accomplish our mission as a team are the same, whether that's the generation of oxygen, the maintenance of pressure, the preparation for things that go off nominally or emergencies, all of those things are so similar. Um, and I think the, the biggest parallel is the kind of teamwork it takes in order to do something that complicated and challenging. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, are there differences also? Now that you've experienced both, um, I'm just curious, what, what are things that aren't so similar? Yeah, the biggest differences in my experience are we have a really small team up here. Right now, there's five crew members on the USOS crew. There's two long-term cosmonauts, and then we have some visitors up here, a cosmonaut and two Japanese spaceflight participants. But compared to a submarine where you have 165 people or so out there with you and every technical specialty on board the ship, 
we have a little bit of a different operational concept. We have a few astronauts aboard the space station, but all of that technical support and expertise is on the ground in mission control in Houston. And so it's a little different than, you know, when you have a problem to solve, you have to check that you have communication coverage, call the ground, and they call the experts, as opposed to just kind of calling, you know, over the 1MC aboard a submarine or going and finding the chief or petty officer who's an expert in that system for help. Um, and then the other thing is it's a lot harder to get a resupply in space. It takes months and sometimes years of planning to get a cargo vehicle or new equipment up here. So it's not as easy as just bringing on new supplies from a, a friendly port. You actually have to have a, everything we need or plan really far in advance to get new supplies. Okay, um, and uh, you've obviously grown accustomed to working in small spaces. As part of the Artemis program, you, you may fly to the moon in increasingly small confines. Um, again, uh, there, are the parallels the same there? And, and how do you adjust to working in very intricate spaces around, you know, literally probably billions of dollars in equipment? Yeah, I think working in small spaces and in confined spaces is always really challenging. It was a huge learning curve getting up here and getting used to the fact that if you let go of something, like I let go of this microphone and look away for too long, you might never see the microphone again. So you really have to pay attention and get used to those things and be really efficient with how you use your space. But the other challenge of working in, in tight quarters is working with te a team. You know, other human beings in those tight quarters can be really challenging. This crew is fantastic, the Expedition 66 crew, and we're having a fantastic time every day. We laugh together, we support each other, and it's just reinforced a lesson I learned in the submarine force that who you're doing it with matters way more than what you're doing. Um, so having the right people around you makes anything possible. Okay, um, and what was it like to launch into space? And was there any part of your training that maybe didn't prepare you for that? Like, was there something that anything that surprised you? The ride to space was absolutely incredible. We launched aboard a Falcon 9 in a SpaceX Dragon capsule, and they've really refined the training since the first few flights. They have recordings of what you can expect it to sound like. We do centrifuge training to experience the G-forces. We practice all the nominal and off-nominal procedures. And so I think for us, we were actually surprised how smooth the ride was. It was actually kind of hard to tell sometimes that you're in a rocket because it was so smooth and when we finally reached um, microgravity we needed our zero g indicator to let us know that we were actually in space so most of the time we're just pinching ourselves but i think our tr training prepares us really well but there's some things you just can't plan for until you experience them yourself getting used to weightlessness how your body feels in weightless weightlessness how to get around um, so there are certain things you just have to wait till you get your first chance to do it Cool, cool. Uh, and what about the spacewalk? Obviously, repair, repaired a damaged antenna. I'm curious how that uh, that that went. What was it like to be out in floating in space for six hours plus six hours plus? The spacewalk was absolutely incredible. I think that's a big part of every astronaut's dream to come to the space station includes hopefully the opportunity to do a spacewalk. And I was lucky enough to be part of the team that replaced the antenna you mentioned. And the biggest thing to get used to going outside in the vacuum of space in a spacesuit is it's so different than looking out a window. I thought it was overwhelming and intense to see the Earth through the cupola window here aboard the space station, but seeing it with a full field of view through my spacesuit helmet just blew me away. You really get a sense for how beautiful, how huge the world is. It's moving below you at 17,000 miles per hour, and it's just incredible. Uh, and the best part, I think, about that day was just the entire team showed up and brought their A game. We were outside getting our work done, but we were supported by the rest of the crew inside who suited us up or did robotics operations, and the team in mission control who was ready to support us when things didn't go according to plan. Uh, so it just felt like such an honor to be a part of that team. Cool, cool. Is, is there anything about being in space that, scare, that scares you a little bit? I know that there was a, you know, a missile launched into a satellite that broke and, the, and, and some of that space debris can be um, a bit hairy at times. Is there anything that like is kind of puts your you know, on edge a little bit? 
You know, I always feel that our training prepares us to deal with those unexpected circumstances that come up. And really, I've never been uncomfortable or nervous because I really trust our team. Um, even when the space debris event happened, Mission Control made really good choices, really conservative choices to protect us, and they communicated really clearly about those things. I would say the only time I kind of, you know, said, whoa, this is kind of intense was actually on the spacewalk. Um, it's pretty intense to look down on, at the world. Sometimes you get the sensation that you're just like hanging off the edge of the cliff at the highest height you ever been at. Um, but I was actually talking to my niece and nephew about it the other day. And my nephew and I, over the summer, he was a little scared. He's four. He was a little scared to jump in the cold water of Lake Roosevelt near Spokane. And we were talking about how, you know, everybody gets scared and it's more important to be brave than fearless. And so I think that's kind of all of our attitude that sometimes you get put in uncomfortable or unexpected situations. But if you trust the people around you and trust that you can make it through it, you can, you can do it. Cool. Is there any spot on Earth particularly that you watch for as you as you orbit at 17,000 plus miles an hour? Yeah, it's been really cool actually to brush up on my geography skills as we pass over different areas of the Earth. And you start to recognize these characteristics where you can tell what continent you're over just based on the colors and the geology you see. Uh, but I always look forward to passing over the United States and seeing our home. Um, when we ever we pass over Canada and Alaska, you have an opportunity to see auroras, which are really beautiful. Um, and whether it's a day pass or a night pass, kind of seeing cities that you recognize or have spent time in, looking down at my family in Seattle or my friends in Houston always really warms my heart. Cool, cool. Um, and uh, tell me about, um, in our time remaining, Artemis and whether you would actually fly to Mars and, of course, um, the idea of going to the lunar south pole. I, I'm just wondering, how are you feeling about all of this as we move forward? How are you feeling about all of this? Everybody at NASA is so excited about the Artemis program. The space station has been an incredible platform for the last 20 years, and we've learned so much from operating in low Earth orbit, but we're ready to explore again and push the boundaries, do things that we've never done before. And so the opportunity to return to the moon, not only to visit, but to stay with permanent habitats, to generate power, to do amazing geology, to explore craters, to try to harvest resources, and to practice all of the skills we're going to need to push further on into the solar system to destinations like Mars is just such an exciting challenge and we have the right team to do it at NASA. So we couldn't be more pumped to see the Artemis 1 launch early next year and then the crewed vehicles launch hopefully just within a few years after that. So we're really excited. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, that is all my questions. Um, uh, thanks for taking some time. It's cool to Get to see you here, and um, that you are a pioneer. It's it's really neat. From the submarine force to today, you're still pioneering, and we look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the future. Thank you so much, and go Navy. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to all participants from KCRG TV and the Kitsap Sun. We are now resuming operational audio communications.